We are there. Are we good to go? Yep, we are all set. Wonderful. So first and foremost, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Translational Research Acceleration Program kickoff webinar. My name is Chad Jackson. I am the director of the Preclinical Translational Research Program at the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Before we get started, I would like to review some of the logistical details for this session. Currently, all participant lines are in listen mode only. To ask questions during the session, you can use the Q&A feature on the Zoom control bar to type in your question. Also, if you join by phone today, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Pressing star six will mute and unmute your line. This will go a long way in helping us organize the questions and discussion. Also, today's session is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later time on the Foundation's YouTube page. I'm excited today to present to you all this iteration of the Foundation Fighting Blindness's preclinical research efforts is entitled the Translational Research Acceleration Program. Today, you will hear great talks about how the Foundation's funding efforts are driving research that is making the strides toward developing treatments for inherited retinal disease in dry age-related macular degeneration. But first, let's talk a little bit about the foundation and our beginnings. The foundation, we are, we are actually happy to say that we're celebrating our 50th anniversary as the foundation was established in 1971 um, by the Gund and Berman families, which led the, led the way to establishing the structure in what we know today as the Foundation Fighting Blindness. In the 1970s, little was known about retinal degenerations. Very little research was being done and there were no clinical trials on the horizon. Therefore, this, these families and their ambitions set forth a path in what we see today and the, thing, and the results we're seeing as far as therapies entering the clinic, new clinical trials, and also preclinical development. Their decision to do something has led to us to know that there are over 270 plus genes linked to retinal disease. Also, we're able to um, identify that over 200,000 individuals in the US actually have these rare inher inherited retinal disorders. And if you look globally, that number blooms to over 4.5 million. If you include dry age-related macular degeneration, those numbers climb globally to over 150 million people with some type of retinal disease indication of this sort. And also, these efforts have led to over 38 clinical trials that are currently underway to look for solutions to these problems. And this all goes into sort of driving our mission as a foundation fighting blindness to find the treatments and cures needed for our constituents. We are proud to say that we are the world's leading private source of funding for retinal disease research by raising almost $800 million to date in striving for our mission. At any given time, we are supporting roughly 75 research grants at different universities across the world. And we're happy to say that we've been a part of many breakthroughs such as Luxturna, which was the first gene therapy for IPs, as well as Argus, which is an FDA approved retinal prosthetic species. Even with these advances, the low vision community is genetically complex and unique. Therefore, we would need more therapies. So today, I would like to present to you the Translational Research Acceleration Program. This program is stood up as the next iteration of preclinical development under the funding Here for translational research. Um, I'm just gonna pause for a second. Um, could we hear, we seem to have some background noise. Could everyone please uh, mute their line, please? I would appreciate it. Thank you. Taking care. Thank you. To help us meet this goal, we have stand up this, um, this program, which we're terming TRAP for sh short. This program seeks to address the increase in the number of therapies needed to combat the diversity, complexity, and uniqueness of inherited retinal disease and dry age-related macular degeneration. The mission of this program is to develop a unique program that accelerates the movement of preclinical research toward an investigation, investigational new drug filing and or into clinical trials 
which will provide a robust and diverse pipeline of potential therapies to fight inherited retinal disease and dry age-related macular degeneration. As you see here in the, in the um, graphic, there are three different research priority areas in which people would be applying to. The first is novel medical therapies, which includes small molecules and biologics. Next is genetic technologies, which include viral and non-viral based gene therapies, as well as gene editing and, and or even gene silencing. And lastly, we have regenerative medicine, which includes stem cells, cellular scaffolds, or even the mix of the two. The one, a key unique thing about the program is our acceleration process. We take a proactive management structure and pair the projects with that. This means that they, we have monthly updates, oversight of the research projects um, from an advisory council, as well as direct mentorship from industry professionals. Out of this, of this acceleration project, we hope that we get engagement with third-party investors, as well as new partnerships, all with the goal of, again, following an investigational new drug, following with the FDA, hopefully the establishment of a clinical trial, and ultimately a commercial product. What you will be hearing today are our first um, six awardees from this iteration of our preclinical funding effort. We are happy to say that we have Dr. Tom Ray from the University of Washington. This project is entitled Stimulating Neural Retina Regeneration from Mueller Glia in the Non-Human Primate. Next, we have Dr. Stephen Singh from Columbia University, whose, whose um, project is entitled Therapeutic Cell Specific CRISPR Editing of Redoxacent Target for Autosomal Dominant Retinitis Pigmentosa. And then we have Rob Collin from Radbound University, whose project is entitled Antisense, excuse me, Antisense Oligonucleotides for the Treatment of Stargardt's Disease. Next, we have a project that has been put forth by the Usher 3 Initiative and is being led by Ahmadi Farhan. The title of the, the um, project is Completing Pre-IND Toxicity Studies to advance a novel small molecule therapy for Usher syndrome type three to phase one clinical trials. The next awardee is Dr. Paul Yang from the Oregon Health and Science University, whose project is entitled, Inosine Monophosphate Dehydrogenase Inhibitors are a new class of neuroprotective agent in inherited retinal disease. And last and certainly not least, Dr. Hendrik Scholl of the Molecular and Clinical Ophthalmology Basel. And the project is entitled Cone Based Optogenetics for Vision Restoration. I think you will be very impressed with the projects that we have funded and all of the, um, the researchers that are leading these projects. As I mentioned before, a part of our acceleration projects is hooking up our awardees with industry level expertise. Right now, our mentors are Tom Homan. Philip Harris, as well as Eric Nelson. The extra layer I mentioned as far as the innovation biodiesel, the TRAP project, this council's mission is to lower the energy barriers across the landscape of research and development for each of TRAP awardee along their individual journey. So there we custom make and custom tailor different plans in order to ensure that these research efforts get as, as far and as fast as possible down the preclinical pipeline until Ultimately, they hit the clinic. At the helm here and in the part of the leadership here is Nima Mayhew of Wave Strategy, our own Dr. Um, Janet Cheatham, who has been with the foundation for a number of years as consulting over on our clinical side of the house. We have Jed Chatterson of Gemini Therapeutics, Mark Fields of Yale University. We have Ashwalf Jayagopal of Kodiak Sciences and Hema Kumar, CEO and founder of Oculogenics. They all have been working very hard to better understand and advise our awardees on how to swiftly move their projects forward. That is it for me right now, but next we'll have brief remarks from Dr. Claire Gelfman, our Chief Scientific Officer. Claire, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, Chad, for that great introduction. It's a true pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Claire Gelfman. I'm the 
new chief scientific officer of the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Um, my background is really in ophthalmology, though I've been following the field for many years since my early postdoc days. And I have to say that the ability to, to fund and, and support translational research really speaks to where we are as a field, translating a lot of those early discoveries to a point where they will be at a stage of filing an IND and, and really getting ready for that first in human study. And I think what really excites me about the TRAP award and the awardees that you'll be hearing from in just a moment is the diversity, not just of the pipeline of potential targets, but the types of therapies and the types of delivery modalities. And that really speaks to how the field has advanced uh, over the years. I want to just echo one point from Chad about the gratitude we feel towards our advisory council who reviewed all of these applications, as well as the project mentors uh, that Chad just mentioned, who are going to play pivotal supportive roles uh, in helping uh, each of the awardees uh, progress to their next inflection point. So, you know, a few years ago, Lexterna was approved, and I think it really launched the field as gene therapy being a great way to treat inherited retinal diseases. It gave credibility back to gene therapy and so much has been happening since then. And in that particular example and many that have followed, it really opened the door to restoring function of genes by giving back a corrected copy of the one that was mutated in a specific inherited retinal disease. And that field has really taken off. But with that has really opened up a couple of gaps as well, because as Chad mentioned, there's well over 250 genes that need to be fixed, if you will, to treat patients, uh, individuals who are affected by these inherited retinal diseases. And so one of the things that you're gonna hear about today are some gene agnostic approaches. So approaches where in addition to all the work going on to restore function by giving back a corrected copy of a specific gene, focusing on the disease mechanism that is common to all the different types of mutations in order to, to explore treatments that can help the masses, that can help many individuals affected by different inherited monogenic retinal diseases. So we're gonna start off um, by hearing about not only specifically, uh, uh, not just autosomal recessive diseases, which is more gene augmentation, but there are many types of inherited retinal diseases that don't follow that under that pattern of inheritance, but rather autosomal dominance. And in that case, we have a product being made, a protein product that is not uh, creating a viable cell, that, the, that, the, that the, the cells cannot function properly. So we're gonna hear, about a gene editing approach. We're gonna hear about a CRISPR approach to treat autosomal dominant RP. We're also gonna hear about a different type of gene therapy at the level of the RNA. So the Lexterna program is really all about giving back the DNA, the gene of interest. We're gonna hear about an approach to treat star guards that uses antisense oligonucleotides for treatment and delivery to the eye. We're also going to hear a regenerative medicine approach where actual reprogramming factors are delivered via an adeno-associated viral gene delivery to stimulate the neurons so that Mueller cell of Mueller cells to then turn around and restore cone photoreceptors. And this can really translate into using a regenerative approach to restore vision in both macular degeneration as well as late stage retinitis pigmentosa. I mentioned before in terms of gene agnostic approaches that really understanding the pathways that go awry and the mechanisms is one step prior to really focusing on a therapeutic. In other words, what pathway, what are we looking for that therapeutic to modulate? And we know that neurodegeneration is inherent to a lot of these inherited retinal diseases that are starving for treatment. So neuroprotective agents have been investigated for quite a while. And we're gonna to hear today about a neuroprotective agent that specifically is targeted around inhibiting 
the cellular toxicity that is caused from a buildup of a second messenger protein known as cyclic GMP. We're also going to hear today about some, uh, some earlier preclinical work in non-human primates whose goal is to advance that discovery of a small molecule from, a, from the IND enabling stage to that first in human study, specifically for individuals affected by mutations in Usher's 3, suffering from Usher's 3. And what's unique about this program is when we think about ophthalmic therapies, we usually think about deliveries directly to the eye, but this will be a small molecule approach that's given orally. And so obviously some of the safety considerations are a little bit different from when we have either subretinal or intravitreal delivery approaches. So we're excited to hear about that program as well. And then finally, we're going to hear about optogenetics. Optogenetics has been getting a lot of press lately due to the recent success of the Genocide work that was published just recently from the patient who had been blind from retinitis pigmentosa for 40 years. That was an optogenetics approach. And we're going to hear today about cone-based optogenetics, where we'll hear about reigniting cone cells using an AAV-based approach, again, a gene agnostic approach to reignite the neurons in order for photoreceptors to function and then be able to then trap the message coming in from the light stimulation so that our brains can then interpret what, what, what it is we're seeing. So a lot of exciting work um, is uh, encompassed by our six presenters today. So without further ado, uh, that, I'll pass the baton back to you and um, look forward to uh, hearing all of the talks today. Thank you, Claire, for that, um, the, that overview of, of the projects as well as the research gaps, and we really appreciate it. So first on the, the list, we have Dr. Stephen Singh from Columbia University, um, who will be presenting. So not to waste any time, um, Dr. Singh, take it away. Dr. Singh, you might still be on mute if you are currently speaking. Dr. Sang, we still can't hear you for... Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, th thanks, Chad, and thank uh, FFP for the opportunity to share with you some of our ongoing work. So I want to tell you uh, about a potential, a new target, a relatively new target that can treat uh, uh, many different forms of retinal degeneration. Let's see. So, so the in in the cells in the retina, just like other parts of the body, you need cells that that are, uh, produce lactate, and I will indicate this by using blue. And you need to have cells that consume lactate. And the retina in the is particularly the light sensing neurons really behave like stem cells. Stem cell really loves to uh, uh, mix lots of lactate for uh, immorphin survival. And a supporting cell in that case is the, the, uh, the stroma, uh, the, those um, niche of the stem cells. And these cells are really similar to the pigment epithelium in terms of how it um, uh, metabolizes uh, nutrients and energy source. So this balance of production and consumption is needed. And we, we hypothesize that many different mutations in retinitis pigmentosa and aging would affect this kind of uh, balance. So you need, you, you see in the cursor, we think that the uh, photoreceptor really needs, needs lactate and this lactate is really an essential uh, carbon source for the uh, epithelial cell. So the epithelial cell will consume lactate and photoreceptor need to mostly the rods, the night seeing cells need to make lots of lactate. Either a mutation in any of those uh, 80 different genes that cause retinitis pigmentosa or the aging process will disrupt this balance of uh, lactate. And this is similar to for rejuvenation. So in May, perhaps we can delay the onset for age rate macular degeneration or delay the onset when the people uh, with retinitis pigmentosa instead of going blind in the 40s, we can delay the onset, maybe blindness in the 
in the 60s, if this kind of uh, strategy can work, and what to make uh, the photoreceptor uh, more uh, robust, also in making skin cells to the stem cells is similar to this uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, so-called Yamanaka factors. So what Yamanaka factors to convert a skin cells into, into a stem cell, what it does is just increase, essentially increasing uh, lactate production uh, of this uh, to become stem cell. When stem cells differentiate in the neurons, would then shut down the lactate production and become consumption and the niche will consume the lactate. So, uh, and the reason you need lactate because we really need the uh, synthesis of these uh, lipid rich outer segments, the antenna for the photoreceptors. One of the earliest pathological changes you was noticed by N. Milam and others is that you lost this biosynthetic ability and even though in, in uh, scenarios that we have treated the uh, outer segment, uh, the survival adequately, it's very difficult to get back the uh, normal level of uh, length of the outer segment because it's very difficult to uh, restore the uh, lactate in, uh, uh, even after successful gene therapy. So we will take advantage of the uh, Yamanaka factors uh, for reprogramming to increase lactate production and also examples of how it's going to work. And the reason only quite recently in around 2017 that for most cells, including uh, in the retina, lactate is really the uh, carbon source, the source also for energy production is uh, not many cells actually use glucose uh, uh, and, until realized in uh, 2017. And maybe in the uh, decay of many different mutations, the it all goes through the first order decay. So maybe any of this initial mutation causes some damage and they will converge into this uh, uh, common rate of decay because of the problem of uh, lactate. And this is similar strategy that other people have used in, in the review that we put in the uh, journal clinical investigation how to manipulate uh, 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 different strategies of lactase or glucose to improve cells of, uh, for survival of the uh, cones. So I'll show you the strategy now using how to increase lactate. And, uh, and also just another in organoid, you also lost this kind of outer segment is probably because not sufficient uh, lactate production uh, from patients. So we will use the strategy to buff up the lactate and by using a similar strategy as the Yamanaka factors, just through gene therapy. So there's a, some background, retinitis pigmentosa, people get uh, tunnel vision, all the cells outside died away. And this is a patient with a phosphodiesterase 6 uh, mutation, and our center is still pretty well preserved. So it's just some uh, model system, and the mouse is a pretty uh, good model. This is a patient with a phosphodiesterase mutation and the mouse, you can see this kind of uh, salt and pepper retinopathy, just like in, uh, in, a, in a patient. So the outcome measurements will be looking at the electrical responses in the retina and just count the number of cells. So this mouse over time, you can see that eventually this uh, outer segment over time, they will be, uh, disappear. The electric responses of the retina will also uh, uh, diminished compared to a control. And so when we remove uh, CERT6, you increase the level of hypoxia and diesel factor, CERT6 disappear, increase the level of hypoxia and diesel factor, the 2019 Nobel Prize winning factor. Then you can see improving survival of these uh, for light sensing neurons as opposed to control, even at a later stage when there's no more uh, light sensing neuron, we can still see improving cell survival. And then with the collaboration of Jim Hurley, we indeed see a lot of lactate production, loss of prior rate uh, production using this manipulation of removing uh, CERT6. And then we also use other additional strategies, other uh, candidates, if you uh, this layer of cells uh, in yellow bar, light sensing neurons over time goes away. If you increase the lactate production, you will improve, increase the number of cells. And then you can also increase in the 
uh, uh, function of the cells. Uh, the supposed control eventually become a flat line, and it particularly helps the cone cells. They're more and more robust cone response in the red as opposed to the black bar as the control. There's also more counting on the number of cones, and this is completely dependent on the hypoxia inducible factor because if you uh, remove hypoxia inducible factor, then we do not see uh, any significant rescue. So this is a hypoxia inducible factor dependent uh, rescue. You can also use drugs uh, Euro, in Europe, EMA, European Medical Association, and soon FDA would have uh, improved this drug to also can induce the increased hypoxia inducible factor in the treated animal. You can see that uh, it's also uh, get increased survival supposed to come control. So now we will switch to, uh, we, in, to application in humans. We need to use a genome surgery uh, technology. Uh, and this will remind you that when we introduce in the mouse model, we can only uh, transduce a small area in the mouse, about one fourth of the retina. So the results may not look so robust. And then we, so uh, this is the area highlighted being transduced. And so using the CRISPR technology to improve uh, lactate production in the uh, light sensing neuron, we get much better uh, uh, photoreceptor specific uh, rod responses. And then you can see the mixed rod and cone responses compared to the dark uh, traces, the black trace are control. And then the uh, red traces are the one also improve the cone responses. Looking at cell survival, indeed uh, you get a longer outer segment, more nuclei. This is a uh, little bit slower degeneration. So we're waiting to uh, longer term to get results. So uh, of course we're interested in dominant model. This one is just a recessive model, just like we showed previously of phosphodiesterase. Okay, dominant model, uh, previously we treated a rhodopsin model carrying uh, D190N mutation. This is a slow degeneration, take about one and a half years to see obvious uh, differences. This is using a CRISPR base, uh, uh, switching the, uh, replacing the rhodopsin. And then we can see that the survival is uh, uh, much better using CRISPR treatment. Function is also much better. This is a slow degeneration. So in the, uh, to prepare this uh, lecture, we, uh, we're still waiting for the result for this D190N mutation in rhodopsin. But then we use a faster model called C110, uh, also in the rhodopsin gene is dominant. This is a 15 year old grandchild and this is the uh, grandmother. It's a faster degeneration, so we can now see also uh, not only it works in the fossil diesterase recessive model, we can also see that in the red trace, the uh, rod specific responses, the mixed rod and cone responses, the red trace is treatment. These are the treated area. And then the black trace is the control. And then in the, uh, also in the cone responses, it's also better in the control. This is a slower model than the fossil diesterase, so we're still waiting they might longer to see a bigger difference. So it was in, in this strategy that restoring uh, lactate, making lots of lactate production, I show you uh, two or three examples of using increasing lactate consumption. The same strategy. So increasing lactate consumption, we can also, uh, in the control looks pretty extinguished. And in the treated area, increasing lactate production in the yellow uh, bar is where the injection site and far away from the injection site is a blue. There's no difference compared to the fellow eye, only one row of nuclei left. And then in each area that we can increase the lactate consumption, we can also increase the cell survival. Function is also better, increase it compared to control. And then uh, even the pigment in retinitis pigmentosa disappear in the treated eye. We are, uh, the pigment disappear in retinitis pigmentosa. And those are the number of cone cells. Uh, increasing lactate consumption is an also uh, much uh, a higher level of dots. Those are cone cells. So I think the strategy is to restore this balance between lactate production and lactate consumption, uh, treating the photoreceptor just like a stem cell. So the, the uh, photoreceptor does love to do glycolysis. It makes lots of uh, uh, succinate. And a photoreceptor, just like stem cell, is LGR5 positive, and it does not have the mitochondrial uh, COX4, 
which is another feature similar to uh, stem cells. This is a grant proposal for Otto Warburg. And I wonder if the foundation with this kind of simplified grant, Otto Warburg wrote, I require 10,000 marks. It was funded in full. <laughs> So uh, uh, now I'm uh, uh, happy to take any questions. Is uh, this is a collaboration done with Jim Hurley in Seattle, and uh, also with uh, Nan Kai Wang on the lactate consumption project. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sang, for that wonderful presentation. Covered a lot of material. Um, I'd like to encourage um, the audience again. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A feature in the Zoom um, toolbar. Uh, we do have a question here, and I think uh, people wanna take it up maybe just a, like a higher level with you. And the one of the, the top questions that I have is, what is your, the vision for this technology? Is it to delay retinal degeneration or is it actually to cure it? So it's to, it's to delay the onset. So in the journal clinical investigation review, we, we have a table to show different kind of similar strategy. Of course, one of the uh, uh, good example uh, 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 is the rod derived cone viability factor. So rod derived cone viability factor increase glucose into, into the cone cells, essentially. But uh, our strategy is to uh, manipulate lactate level, both at the production and the consumption and prevent also quite interesting, they, the cones are preferentially safe more than, even more than the rods. So you increase the lactate uh, production. So we, and, and, then, and then the hypothesis is that uh, in aging, just like, just like mutations damaged by retinitis pigmentosa, aging will break down this, this balance. So you can restore the balance. Maybe this is also would delay not only the onset for retinitis pigmentosa, but also for macular degeneration. We have a question from the audience and it says, um, did you mention that this particular drug was in the FDA approval stage? Which drug were you speaking of? Retux, uh, the uh, FD492 is, uh, uh, it, is, is uh, in US, is, uh, I think maybe in the next few months we'll get uh, approved for treatment of anemia. This drug, uh, it increases does increase the lactate in the in the retina, uh, but it's not as uh, efficacious as using a CRISPR based approach to buff up the lactate. And this is uh, it's approved by European Medical Agency for the treatment of anemia. It is approved in uh, China FDA for treatment of anemia. We have another question. So set um, six is uh, the first one we tried. So set six definitely does work. And, and then the English half on berries does inhibit CERT6. So part of the uh, longer program is that we have many, there's many different ways you can in, increase uh, lactate, including CERT6 inhibition. Uh, then we are just working on which are the uh, most optimum uh, in, uh, ways, including CERT6, uh, uh, other ways to improve uh, lactate production. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, I believe we're right on schedule right now. So we'll go to the next presenter. Again, Dr. Sang, thank you so much for that presentation. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Next to the floor, we have uh, Dr. Rob Collin. Could you please come off mute? And you have the floor, sir. Yes, I did. Let me share my screen. Is it visible for everyone? We can see it. Yes, yes perfect. Okay, thank you, Chad, for the introduction. And uh, of course, also thanks to the FFB for uh, inviting me to present uh, my work here today. And of course, for, uh, for granting me the, the TRAP award. And as already said in the introduction, we, we take a slightly different approach compared to the, what we say, classical uh, gene therapy. And, and we really try to target the RNA, and in this case in particular for Stargardt disease. So with this Stargardt disease, it's a uh, progressive disorder, uh, mainly affecting central vision, uh, especially in the, in the start of the disease. 
It's inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion, and it has a prevalence of approximately one in 10,000 individuals worldwide. If you look at uh, autofluorescence imaging, like you can see on the picture uh, here in the lower uh, left corner, you can see that it's really characterized by, by flags, and it's easily and well recognized by an experienced ophthalmologist. It also has a variable age of onset and disease scores, as depicted in the other graph. So you really have patients in which the disease starts uh, in the first or second decade of life, but also uh, people that have uh, only the first complaints at a, at a later onset. And uh, this is caused by the fact that it's uh, caused by biallelic mutations in the ABCA4 gene, and not every ABCA4 mutation is the same. I think to date we know more than 900 different mutations. Some of them are really null alleles, so they lead to no uh, functional ABCA4 protein, but there are also some moderate and mild alleles. And depending on the combination of ABCA4 alleles that you have in a recessive disease, you have an early, an intermediate, or a late onset. So what's the problem? The problem is that there is no effective treatment available. And that sounds very bold, but that's still uh, the way it is. That said, Stargard disease has a lot of interest also in the field of therapeutic development. And this is a graph uh, from a review that we wrote uh, last year. And you can see that there are many different strategies already being tested in clinical trials. Cell therapy, different compounds that each have a, a different mode of action, and also gene therapy. Although with gene therapy, the problem is that ABCA4 cDNA does not fit into a single AAV. That said, we decided to take another approach. And that's the approach of antisense oligonucleotides. We call them AONs. I know that in the US, a lot of people call them ASOs. They are the same. So what are they? They are small synthetic RNA or hybrid DNA RNA molecules, depending on the effect that you want to achieve. And you can design them in such a way that they are complementary to your pre-mRNA. And again, depending on the chemistry, they are able to specifically bind the target and in our case, modulate pre-mRNA splicing. In addition, they are chemically modified to increase the uptake, the stability, and also the affinity for their target. One modification that's often used is a sulfur atom. We call that the phosphorotioate uh, backbone and also a 2-O-methyl or a 2-O-methoxy ethyl group on the, on the ribose ring uh, helps to, to, uh, to increase this uptake, the stability, and the target affinity. So uh, I think a decade ago, uh, also funded by, by the FFB, uh, we were able to, to show proof of concept of this method. And we did that for septu 90 associated LCA. And this is the first mutation that we started to approach with an AON. And this was a deep intronic mutation identified in 2006 by my colleagues uh, Anneke den Hollander and Frans Kremers in the lab. And they found it was one of the first intronic mutations that were identified. Because of this G at this position, in healthy individuals there is an A, all of a sudden there is a new axon created. We call it a pseudo axon. So it's being recognized as an axon by the splicing machinery, but it should not be an axon in the sense that it doesn't contain a proper part of the protein. Upon splicing, part of this pseudo axon gets inserted into the mRNA. In this case, there is a stop codon, so you get an incorrect uh, protein synthesis. By using an AON and designing the AON to be exactly complementary to that pseudo axon, you can block the binding of the splicing factors. The entire pseudo axon is skipped. You get a merge of axon 26 and axon 27 the way it should be, and you get a 100% correct uh, transcript and protein. In view of time, I will not go into any further details. The only thing I want to show is that nine years later, after uh, starting a collaboration with ProQR Therapeutics, uh, this AON was further developed. It was show shown to be uh, efficacious in cellular models. It was shown to be safe in tox studies, and patients were injected intravitreally with this AON. And the first results that were published two years ago were really promising in the sense when you compare the treated versus the contralateral non-treated eyes, significant proof improvement in visual acuity was measured. So that was very hopeful. 
And we thought that we could also apply this trick to Stargar disease, and especially by work of my close colleague, uh, Professor Dr. Franz Kremers, a lot of deep intronic mutations in the ABC of 4 gene were identified. But once you identified such a mutation, you can ask yourself two questions. Are these deep intronic variants indeed affecting pre-mRNA splicing? And if so, how? And knowing what we did for SEPTA-90, can we do something about it? I will show you one example of how we test that. And we do that by artificial MIDI genes. So you clone a region of the ABCA4 gene into a splicing vector, and by side-directed mutagenesis, you can insert your variant of interest, the variant that you find in the DNA of the patient. You then compare the wild type versus the mutant uh, MIDI gene, you transfect it into hex cells, isolate RNA, do an RT-PCR analysis, and then following gel electrophoresis, you can identify the PCR products. For instance, if you PCR from ABCA4 exon 7 to exon 8, you can see that upon introduction of this mutation, a pseudo exon is inserted uh, into the transcript. And if you then sequence that, you can identify what goes wrong at the RNA level. So in this case, it was a 56 nucleotide insertion caused by this G to C change. And what you then immediately can do is start designing AONs and combine the MIDI gene transfection with or without AONs. That's what you see here in this blue rectangle, where we combine the mutant MIDI gene together with three AONs, a non-transfected control, and a sense oligonucleotide, which is also a negative control. And you see that AON1 and AON3 are able to fully restore the aberrant splicing. Subsequently, we also tested that in fibroblast from a Stargard case to see whether it's not just an effect with the artificial MIDI gene system, but exactly the same two AONs, one and three, were also effective in the, in the fibroblast cells of the Stargard case. So where we are now, we have uh, a long list of, of ABCA4 mutations. Most of them are in introns, but also uh, a common 768 G to T mutation in exon 6, which also leads to aberrant splicing. And for all of these mutations, we have identified effective AONs, at least in cell lines. And we picked three, three of the most common mutations to put into this uh, TRAP program and develop them further up to uh, clinical trials. So how does that look? This is a graphical summary. We have a molecular part, and uh, as said, for the three mutations that, that I showed, we are already in stage four and five, where we are testing AONs in patient-derived fibroblasts, photoreceptor precursor cells, and retinal organoids, and not only at the RNA level, but also at the functional level. After this has been achieved, we also want to determine off-target effects by transcriptome analysis. So does your AON not affect the splicing of other genes and toxicology studies in rodents and or non-human primates? In addition to the three mutations that I mentioned, we also want to continue this pipeline for novel uh, genetic defects that we are uh, still identifying. In addition, we also have a clinical arm of the study. We do that together with Professor uh, Hoying at the Radboud UMC where we want to first determine the natural history on the retrospective level, but also in the perspective study, we find the right outcome measures with the ultimate uh, aim to, to do IND filing and to start clinical trials, where we really inject Stargard cases with our AONs and hopefully measure therapeutic benefits. With that, I would like to conclude and uh, state that I think that antisense oligonucleotides offer an attractive therapeutic strategy for IRDs, including Stargard disease. And in comparison to, to other strategies, they really address the root cause, so the erroneously spliced RNA. There are no expected issues with delivery because you just can inject uh, AUN in a solution by an intravitreal injection. And the promising efficacy data that have been generated for SEP290, but also for H2A, uh, really shows hope that these AUNs are an effective strategy to, uh, to target some of the uh, genetic forms of IRD. With that, I would like to thank uh, a lot of people, but especially the people in, in red. I share a lab together with uh, Alex Garanto. Lonneke Duikos is a technician that's been working from, with me for nine years. And Frans Kremers and Karel Hoing from the Radboud UMC will also play a really instrumental role in all the ABC4 uh, work that we are doing. And I'm happy to take your questions. 
Thank you, Dr. Collin, for that wonderful presentation. I think that your preliminary evidence as well as the history of this technology are very convincing and very promising. So thank you for sharing that with us. We do have a question here. Um, what functional activities are measured following the um, AON delivery to the retinal organoids? So how are you actually measuring whether it was efficacious or not? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a very important question uh, to which I, I still don't have a, an ideal answer. Uh, and it depends a little bit on the, on the gene and the protein that you're studying. Uh, for instance, for CEP290, uh, it was a ciliary protein. So uh, there they could measure uh, cilium length, uh, but also transport of other proteins along the cilium, et cetera. Um, for ABC4, it's a little bit uh, uh, more difficult. We know that ABC4 uh, is an, a transporter important in individual cycle, and that ABC4 dysfunction leads to lipofuscin accumulation. Uh, we have not yet tested whether we can show lipofuscin accumulation in, in patient-derived retinal organoids. If we can do that, then perhaps that would be a readout to see whether you can diminish that lipofuscin accumulation. Other things you can look at is ABC4 protein uh, restoration, so western blot, but also the, the morphology of the cells, uh, whether ABC4 is at the right location in these organoids. So these are the type of studies that you have to think of at the moment. All right. Next question is, I mean, this really seems like a, a great platform technology. Um, could you give us a sense for what are the limitations? So if people are excited about this for either a family member or their indication, are there limitations that they have to consider when sort of thinking about this type of technology? Yeah. Well, I think one limitation is that it is a mutation specific approach. So uh, I think we can, especially for the deep and running mutations, we can pretty easily design AONs that can correct the, the splicing defect. But if there are only uh, a few patients worldwide, then it's pretty challenging to put that in a clinical trial, at least the way that clinical trials are being set up at the moment. So I think that is a challenge. Uh, the second challenge is that uh, the AONs are RNA molecules and they do degrade. So at the moment, we believe that you would need two to four injections per year in order to maintain a sufficiently high level of AONs to keep correcting the, the, the aberrant RNAs. And I think the third thing, and that's also really crucial, is that um, it may work at the RNA level, but you also need to show that it works at the clinical level. So for instance, for Stargar disease, uh, the incentive is to stop the progression of the disease, but then you really need to have the right natural history data and also the right endpoints to be able to measure the effect. Even if the effect may be there, you also need to measure it. I think that's, uh, in particular, one of the, the key challenges that we're facing. All right. And we have a, a question here um, as well. Is that, can you clarify if your technology differs from what's going on at ProQR? Or is it very okay. similar in that you're feeding into sort of that, that wider community of um, AON therapy? Yes. Yes, it's exactly the, the same strategy. And uh, okay. the, the technology that ProQR is using has been, uh, well, invented in the Radboud GMC. So for us, by, uh, by us for the CEP290 and by my colleague Erwin van Eyck for, uh, for H2A. So it's, it's exactly the same uh, approach. All right. Thank you for those, um, those answers. And again, thank you for showing such wonderful um, data. And we're very much looking forward to seeing the progress of this project. So, thank you. All right, next up, we have um, the Usher 3 initiative and representing them is Mari Farha. Could you please come off of um, mute and start your presentation? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you see the slides? Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you all for attending and Thank you, Chad, for the introduction. And I would like to thank the FFB for giving us this opportunity. Uh, about 100 years ago, uh, an ophthalmologist in Scotland, in the UK, has noticed that some of his patients who were coming to him with visual disturbances also had some problem with their hearing. In fact, he made a series of about 69 patients, and he reported it in 1914. 
and it's a, a combined abnormality of vision and hearing loss in a patient group which seem to have an inherited basis and most likely it is an autorecessive. And since that time, the Asher syndrome name has stayed. So this is the beginning of the Asher disease. What is Asher syndrome? Let me just... Can you, can you move the slide or? Are you seeing the slide? Yes? We can see your slide. Okay, okay, sorry, I'm having a. So what is the Asher syndrome? Asher syndrome is characterized by a combined vision loss and hearing loss leading eventually to blindness. And deafness. And in some patients, it's associated with some balance disorder due to vestibular. In fact, the frequency of this disease is about one in 30,000 in the United States. However, with advances in genetic analysis and medicine, we realize there are three different types of Usher syndrome, and they're called Usher syndrome type 1, type 2, and type 3. And we're really talking here about Asher syndrome type three, which is the rarest type. It only represents 4%. But the combined disorder of deafness and blindness account for 50% of people with Asher syndrome. The, which, which genes are affected in the Asher three syndrome? It is Claren one gene, and this gene is responsible and encoding for claren one protein. Claren one protein uh, is depicted on the right hand of the slide. It is a transmembrane protein made out of 232 amino acids. And there are over 14 mutations known to cause abnormality in this protein. And they are highlighted with the arrows there. One of the commonest mutation in the protein is the PN48K, where there is a single substitution of aspargine by lysine, one amino acid. That lead to claren one being abnormally, and therefore it does not translocate to its site of action to the plasma membrane and get, deg and get deg degraded by the cell, and therefore loss of function. This loss of function lead to ashra 3 and similarly, regardless of the mutation, whether if it leads to truncated protein or slightly abnormal protein, this all lead to the same phenotypic observation in the clinic, loss of hearing and loss of vision. The Asher 3 syndrome, can you see the slides, is a progressive disease. And this video will just show you the nature of the progression of this disease. Let's see if we So the disease is very progressive. Individuals with Asher 3 are born with normal hearing and normal vision. And as they grow into their <coughs> childhood, the hearing loss starts to be noticed. However, fortunately, this develops after speech has been already developed. And gradually the hearing gets worse until the age of 40, 45, it becomes extremely severe. And most of these individuals would require a hearing aid. As far as the vision concerned, as we have noticed in the video, it starts late in adolescent and gradually you start to notice 
difficulty in manipulating at dark areas and you have what's called light blindness. And as time progresses, the vision field becomes too narrow until eventually you have a, a tunnel vision. And finally, you lose the acuity. And by the age of 45, 55, the majority of individuals are legally blind and deaf. It's not just the deafness and the blindness, it is the impact on the whole quality of life with this disease. Uh, people have to make a lot of choices in life. Do they go to school? Do they have a, a job? Do they have a partner? Do they get married? Can they go on holiday? So there is a huge impact and a lot of people manage this disease with modifying basically their lifestyle and some of them actually become isolated and others do not. So what is the current standard of care for this devastating disease? At the moment, as we speak, is absolutely no specific therapy for Asher disease, like what we heard with other diseases before. Also, there is no clinical trial ongoing at the moment specific for Asher 3. There is, there is early trial, which include Asher 3 patients, whether they are gene therapy or regenerative medicines or small molecules, but there is no specific trial for that with, with Asher 3. Uh, the patient cope with the vision loss by education, by lifestyle modification, by visual magnifiers, etc., And with the hearing, there is the possibility of having a cochlear implant. However, the implants are a surgery, it's a traumatic, the usual expensive, and they require further adjustment. So really, this is a devastating disease on the, on the individuals. It affects all their life with no clear treatment. And for that reason, the Asher Initiative was started about 14 years ago. The initiative is started by Cindy, who is, I think, in, in the audience, Cindy Elden, and her late father, Richard Elden. Cindy was diagnosed with Asher 3 at the age of five when she noticed that she has some issue with hearing. But at that time, as we hear a few years ago, there wasn't really a lot known about Asher 3 or any treatment. So Cindy and her father decided to start a non-profit organization, really seeking a treatment or a solution for this devastated disease. And they pursued this vision tirelessly over the last few years. They worked with multiple researchers at different universities in the US and outside the US, and they worked with different clinicians and ophthalmologists and auditory physicians to come up with a treatment. And through uh, Wisconsin University uh, using a high throughput program, they identified a molecule which we know as BF844, which has the ability, at least in cellular assays, to promote the clarin one translocation to the plasma membrane and also reduce its degradation. So that was a, a promise. And the data on this molecule has been published in the Nature article in 2016. We think if this molecule succeeds, as Chad said, it's an oral therapy. If it succeeds, it will tackle both aspects of the Asher disease, the hearing and the vision. And it will improve the clinical outcome and the quality of life for many patients. Just a little bit about BF844, what we have done so far. So after the identification of the molecule, we optimized the molecule in terms of the chemistry. Uh, we have done a number of in vitro studies to make sure that it is stabilizing the clarin one protein. And we used as a model, the commonest mutation found in the US, the N48K. We also, have done all the screening for in terms of, of proper biologic action, actions, it's a protein binding, it's uh, te tetragenicity, mutagenicity, all the normal screen. And so far, none of the results we have indicate that we should not go very fast with developing this compound. We also have done a number of PK studies, and we also have done two toxicity studies, both in dogs and in rats. So, we have done the distribution of this molecule. It seemed to be distributed throughout the, the blood and 
we have recovered this molecule from the cochlea or from the retina, indicating it actually does cross the blood brain barrier, the blood cochlear barrier, and the blood retinal barrier. That gives us some confidence that when this medication is, is taken by the oral route, it will get to its site of actions. And therefore, we think it's warrant urgent development. In terms of the proof of concept in the preclinical development, we have got a mouse model where we instated the N48K and the mouse did exhibit the hearing loss we see in humans, a gradual hearing loss. Unfortunately, the mouse model did not exhibit the vision loss. And up to this point, there isn't really a suitable animal model which exhibit the vision loss. So if we look at, the, at this experiment, if you look at the top line and the axis is time and, and the y axis is the hearing, the higher the line, the better the hearing. So a healthy mouse would hear a 30 decibel, which is equivalent to a whisper. From birth, 22 days old, 50, 55 days old, there is no hearing deterioration. A mouse with the clarin 1 mutation, which is a bottom line, would have a gradual decline of hearing, very similar to what we see in a human being. And by 22 days postnatal, the mouse will not hear the whisper, will only hear loud ambient noise. And then 55 days, it would only hear 100 decibel, which is equivalent to a wood shop noise. However, a treated mouse will actually recover, which is the middle line and here almost as good as a healthy mouse. And this is a clear proof of concept that BF844 given to mice with the mutated gene, it's prevent their hair loss or at least slow it down significantly. Sorry. So where we are now and what we have achieved thus far, so we have done the efficacy model. As I said, we've done a number of in vitro assays, which shows that BF844 restores the protein, reduces degradation, and translocates it to the plasma membrane. And we have done that in a number of missense mutations. Although we talked about the commonest one, the N48K mutation, we tried it on a number of ASHRA3 missense mutation, and we seem to get the same results. In terms of safety, we've done up to two weeks, animal toxicity, kinetic, cellular assays, and we have up to now no significant safety issues. We start to make the compound in a small scale, and now we are in the process of producing it at a large scale to start the final part of the animal studies. And also to optimize the formulation to be able to go into human beings. The FFP grant has really did what Chad said, has really helped us to, try to accelerate our development from a late preclinical to complete the GMP clinical toxicity in order to obtain the FDA approval for initiating clinical trials. And we hope our program will complete by the end of this year, get the data early next year and enter the clinical trial mid of next year. I'll give you a bit more detail. So now we are in July, August, where we're really getting the clinical program designed and identifying potential sites and identifying potential investigators and working at some aspect of markers for the program. Because as you know, this disease is slow. Then we're meeting with the FDA to discuss our program and have their blessing. Then we will have the drug by then as manufactured and in November, we'll start the final toxicity and kinetic studies in rats, then in dogs, then we do the safety pharmacology study. We will finish the studies in December. We'll get the data analyzed and written by February, and we'll submit for an IND in March. And I think I would like to thank you all and thank the FFB for, for supporting us. And I think if we can manage just to produce this compound, that would help or at least slow down the progression of vision and hearing loss, given we can give it to people earlier on in life before their quality of life deteriorates. That will be 
a goal worth going for. And with that, I would like to thank you all. If you need to contact us, here is our details. Thank you. Mahdi, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Appreciate it. Um, even though we're a little bit behind time, I'd like to um, ask a couple questions that came from the audience. The first question is, can you um, please maybe just further explain how you foresee this, um, this drug being administered in the clinic? You mentioned that it would be is an oral formulation, but can you just tell a little bit more what, how you see it being given to patients? Yes, the, all the experiments we have done in animals so far, they were done through the oral route. We actually made a solution of the drug and, it, and gave it to the animal by mouth. We expect any human being will be done, at least initially as a capsule, will be taken once a day for a number of, of months. However, the plan is if this product becomes successful and actually gets into the clinic, we foresee the once daily capsule we start with during clinical trial to be changed into once weekly, even with the current technology of formulation, you can actually have a patch which you can stick just in your skin, which deliver the drug over time. And it can be taken once a week, once a month, even once every six months. So I think, you know, what, if the drug becomes successful, I think there is a huge a potential in, in making it convenient for a patient. Uh, it's pain-free. It's, it, as you said, its toxicity will be well known. It can be even used in combination with gene therapy. Uh, it also can be used if the data continue to come the way we're seeing it, looking at other disease. We can actually look at multiple other diseases where there is the missense mutation is the underlying cause. Okay, and lastly, um, we you talked a little bit about sort of like the animal models and basically, and, and also in the disease indication, there being a vision as well as a hearing phenotype. Um, someone in the audience would like to know what happens to the late administration of BF844 on hearing? So if you don't catch it early, if you administer it later on, does it have any sort of efficacy on hearing then? Uh, we. We believe it will have because there's one experiment we did earlier on where we administered it in a mouse which is already has some loss of hearing and, and it did uh, reduce the, the rate of deterioration. I think you know the, it does improve the amount of the protein in the cell and therefore we expect regardless where the disease is, it should at least halt the speed of progression. But ideally, really you should give it before you lose a lot of your photoreceptors or your glial cells or your hair cells. So ideally you should give it early, but that does not mean uh, if you have some residual hearing and some resi residual vision that you should not give it. I think it should be given as long as there is a residual element left because we believe it will slow down the progression. All right. Um, unfortunately, we, don't, we have, um... We are, we are past time and uh, we'll have to move on. Uh, Mari, I will forward you any additional questions that the audience has so, we, so they can get answered. Thank you. So next up, we will have Dr. Uh, Paul Yang for his presentation. Dr. Yang, please take it away. Okay, thank you. Let me share the screen. All right, um, making sure you see the presentation screen. Okay, and not my presentation mode, yes, okay. Um, all right, let's get started here. Well, first of all, um, I wanna thank FFB for their support and this opportunity to discuss inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase inhibitors and its new role as a small molecule neuroprotective agent for inherited retinal degenerations. Inherited retinal degenerations, uh, as we know, are a heterogeneous group of blinding disorders associated with mutations in hundreds of genes. Neuroprotective agents um, and that are generalizable to a large proportion of patients are critically needed, but yet none are currently available. The proposed studies uh, will validate IMPDH as a drugable target that is agnostic to genotype 
and identify a lead therapeutic for neuroprotection in IRD. We propose that anosine monophosphate dehydrogenase or IMPDH, uh, the, that these inhibitors are a new class of neuroprotective agents in IRD that slow degeneration by suppressing photoreceptor cyclic GMP cytotoxicity, which is a common pathway of photoreceptor cell death. So what is IMPDH? IMPDH is a ubiquitous enzyme that is key for the biosynthesis of guanine nucleotides. Guanine nucleotides are precursors to RNA and DNA and thus required for cell division. Clinically, IMPDH is already a recognized druggable target to treat autoimmune disease, organ transplant rejection, and viral infections. IMPDH inhibitors may either have a predominant immunomodulatory action via inhibition of cell division and lymphocytes or antiviral activity. Mycophenolic acid and ribavirin are already FDA approved medications for kidney transplant and treating chronic hepatitis C respectively. Uh, mesoribin is approved in Japan for immunosuppression and merimpotib is in clinical trials currently for hepatitis C. Guanine nucleotides also play key roles as cofactors for G proteins and intracellular signaling as an essential component to the phototransduction cascade within photoreceptors. However, in inherited renal degenerations, one of these guanine nucleotides, cyclic guanosine monophosphate or cyclic GMP, has been shown by Paquette Duran and colleagues to play a key role in a common cell death mechanism by triggering either a PKG or calpane mediated pathway for photoreceptor cell death. The cyclic GMP dependent photoreceptor cell death pathway is a promising target as it's been shown to be relevant in at least six genotypes of IRDs as shown here. Four genotypes that account for 20% of RP and two genotypes that account for 10% of cone rod dystrophy. Thus, our proposal to optimize the neuroprotective IMPDH inhibitor for clinical trials will have a potentially significant impact by benefiting a large proportion of patients with RP and cone rod dystrophy. We hypothesize that IMPDH plays a key role in photoreceptor cyclic GMP cytotoxicity and propose that IMPDH inhibitors are a new class of neuroprotective agents that slow retinal degeneration by suppressing cyclic GMP cytotoxicity and photoreceptor cell death. We have recently published a landmark article detailing the neuroprotective effects of mycophenolate, which is a reference IMPDH inhibitor in two mouse models of RP. For the sake of time, I will only show some of the results from RD10 mice, which is the prototypical mouse model of RP and cyclic GMP dependent photoreceptor cell death. First, we show that IMPDH inhibition preserves photoreceptors and suppresses photoreceptor cyclic GMP cytotoxicity. Shown here are cross-sectional immunohistochemistry images of retina from wild-type C57 mice or RD10 mice. The area between the arrowheads uh, show the thickness of the photoreceptor layer, which is thinned in naive RD10 mice in addition, you can see lots of red spots in the photoreceptors, which are indicators of cyclic GMP cytotoxicity. But in RD10 mice treated with mycophenolate, there is no evidence of cyclic GMP cytotoxicity, and the photoreceptor thickness is highly preserved in a manner similar to normal C57 mice. This translates to preservation of rod and cone mixed photoreceptor function as shown in these electroretinogram waveforms. In naive RD10 mice, the waveform is truncated, whereas in RD10 mice treated with mycophenolate, the ERG waveform looks more similar to C57 mice. Finally, we also showed that the RD10 mice treated with mycophenolate exhibited improved visual behavior, which was observed by placing mice in a chamber with visual stimuli consisting of rotating stripes. In the figure, higher up on the y-axis is better. The treated RD10 animals had significantly better visual behavior than naive RD10 mice. The proposal is a natural expansion of our prior work. 
First, we will use whole retinal explant cultures as a higher throughput in vitro model to screen for three other IMPDH inhibitors and compare it to mycophenolic acid in order to determine the lead agents. Two, we will test the lead agents on the mouse models for all six genotypes of IRD associated with cyclic GMB dependent photoreceptor cell death in order to determine generalizability as well as determine retinal pharmacokinetics and safety. Finally, we will verify IMPDH as a neuroprotective target by knocking out IMPDH1 in RD10 mice and assessing for the expected beneficial impact on cyclic GMP cytotoxicity and photoreceptor generation. I wanna thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. All right. Actually, uh, Dr. Yan, we're going to hold the questions until the end, um, just for in lieu of time, so we can ensure that we get all the presentations. Sure. And so we'll we'll come back to you at the end of the um, at the end of the presentations for questions. Next, we have Dr. Uh, Thomas Ray from Washington University that will be speaking to us about how are we going to make new photoreceptors from neuroglia. Uh, Dr. Ray, could you please come off mute and? You are up for your presentation. Okay. Um, I think this should do it. Okay. So uh, thanks to the foundation for the TRAP award and for allowing us to present uh, the work today from our team. Here at the University of Washington, um, we have a group of eye researchers, uh, myself, uh, who will be leading the project. Um, Dr. Fred Rieke, Dr. Rachel Wong, and Dr. Jennifer Chow are all instrumental in um, accomplishing the goals of the TRAP award. Normally, the retina contains many different cell types, and you've heard from the other presentations that uh, these cell types include the rods and the cones and the pigmented epithelium. And there are a host of other retinal cells, um, and these are all um, collectively called retinal inner neurons. And these cells are also necessary for the normal functioning of your retina. Um, all of these cells, the pigmented epithelial cells, the rods and the cones, and all the inner retinal neurons are all made before you're born. And just like the neurons in your brain, um, once they're made, for the most part, um, they are not replaced if they're lost by a disease or trauma. So it's, it's basically true that the brain neurons you're born with are the ones you're going to have when you die, and it's the same for the retinal neurons. And um, unfortunately, as these neurons uh, die due to disease or trauma, then there is no intrinsic mechanism that allows them to be replaced. So in a normal retina, we have the complement of the rods and the cones and the inner retinal neurons and the um, pigmented epithelial cells shown up here. Um, and then as uh, in retinitis pigmentosa, the rod photoreceptors will degenerate and they'll be lost early in the disease. Um, and then as the disease progresses, uh, in many cases, the cone photoreceptors also degenerate. And um, once that happens, there's really no input layer to these other retinal neurons. So even though these other retinal neurons survive and are, um, and, and in many cases retain their wiring and their correct circuitry, they, um, they don't have any input anymore, and so they can't function. Now in some species, um, retinal injury or disease isn't a problem because they have an in intrinsic mechanism for regeneration. So we first discovered this in birds many years ago, but this is mostly, uh, something that we see uh, more uh, robustly in, in animals like fish and even frogs. And that is that these glial cells, so the retina has both the, the neurons that I described, as well as a support cell called a glial cell, and in particular, a Mueller glial cell. And this cell in the fish, after loss of the rods and the cones, will make uh, many more Mueller glial cells. And then these glial cells will actually turn into things that we would call progenitors. And those progenitors go on to make new rods in the cones. And so the fish can go from a retinal state where they've lost all the rods in the cones to one more new Mueller glia, make new progenitors, and then these give rise to new rods and cones again. 
So it's been our goal for many, many years since we first discovered this process occurs in, um, in birds to try and make um, the retina of mammals like a mouse or um, humans like ourselves acquire the same potential and, and see if we can make our glial cells able to make neurons again. Basically, it's summed up in this slide. Normally during our development, when we're in utero, in fetal development, we have these cells called progenitors or stem cells, retinal stem cells, and they make both the neurons and the muller glia in your retina. What happens in, in regeneration in fish and birds is these muller glia can go backwards and make progenitors, which can then make these neurons again. So that's the, that's the goal of our project. And we've tried to understand why these cells are able to convert into these cells in the fish, but not in the mouse, by comparing the genes that are expressed in these two different cells. All cells have genes that are expressed in them that are unique to that cell type, and progenitors have genes that are important for conveying on them the ability to make new neurons. But Mueller glia in adults like us, adult humans or adult mice, don't have the genes anymore to make the neurons. And the fish allow, the fish has a process by which these Mueller glia can acquire the genes of progenitor cells, and then those genes help them make neurons again. So we compared the genes of the Mueller glia and the progenitor cells to try and figure out what, what's missing in mouse and human Mueller glia. And we found this alphabet soup of genes. These are called transcription factors. And when they're highly expressed, as we see here in the progenitor cells, um, these genes are shown in red. But as they, uh, as they become, uh, as we look at Mueller glial cells over here, uh, we see that there's low level expression and that's green. So we picked this alphabet soup of factors and we took them and we put them back into, they, they were high in progenitor cells. We tried to introduce them back into Mueller glial cells to see if that would make them competent to make new neurons. We did this in uh, cultured cells. You've heard a little bit already today about how people make tissue culture as a test bed for this. And one of these genes was particularly effective. It converted these sort of gray, flat looking cells here, which are the glia, into these bright, shiny, little, highly branched neuron cells, as you see over here. So that led us to, um, to understand that this was a candidate gene then that we could use to try and essentially reprogram the Mueller glia into progenitors, much like what the fish and the bird do naturally. We were able to now make the mouse do this, at least in our tissue culture. We then applied this to uh, mice in, in vivo, in the actual mouse. And here is a picture of what these Mueller glial cells actually look like when they've been injected with a uh, gene that then uh, turns on a fluorescent protein in these cells. And in addition to the fluorescent protein, it turned on this key reprogramming transcription factor, ASCL1. And once it did that, now these cells were competent to regenerate new neurons. And so what we see here is after injury to the mouse, now these glial cells now made these neurons that we see right here. And when we patch clamp onto those neurons, we can see they now respond to light. And so basically this was able to, we were able to show that this one transcription vector allowed these glial cells to now become more like the fish and the frog and make new neurons after injury. Now we've been improving this technology. So now we get nearly uh, 80 to 90% of the glial cells now can regenerate new neurons. And in addition to uh, these inner retinal neurons, we see cells out in the rod, oops, out in the rod in the cone layer as well. And we now show that uh, these cells that we see in the rod in the cone layer express the genes of, of cones. So we make multiple different cell types, including these inner retinal neurons like amacrine cells and bipolars. And then we also make cones and a large population of immature neurons that over time will differentiate into one or another of these different states. And that's shown uh, by uh, what we're looking at here is each dot represents a cell. And so once we put these reprogramming factors, there are very few dots that are Mueller glia left anymore, even though 
every cell started out as a new nuclei, but now they all become either progenitors or different types of neurons. So we now have a way of very effectively uh, stimulating neurogenesis from mutter glia in the mouse retina. So the aim of our project was to try and see if we could do this in the non-human primate. Uh, currently, the standard of care is there's really no method to replace photoreceptors in the human retina. So um, the attempts to restore vision so far have been um, are primarily to either use stem cell, stem cell derived neurons that are generated outside the body in a, in a petri dish and then transplanted to the retina, or alternatively to use a type of prosthetic device. And what we're proposing is to harness this power of the Mueller glia to regenerate neurons in it, within the retina. So um, that will simplify the uh, ability to restore vision to those who have lost all their photoreceptors. So first we had, we, had we, we wanted to test whether we could do this in the Petri dish like we did in the mouse. And that was our first aim. And for that, what we do is we take monkey um, retinas uh, and that have been used for other purposes already, but they would be discarded. And so we take these monkey retinas and we dissociate the cells from these retinas. And then we grow those in our tissue culture Petri dish, much as we did with the mice. Then we add reprogramming factors, and that's shown here. We can track the reprogramming factors infectivity in these cells by their uh, GFP, uh, these fluorescent proteins that allow us to follow the cells that we've infected with our reprogramming factor. And then we look to see whether they acquire uh, the properties of new neurons. That is, can, they, can the reprogramming factors that we found work in mice actually also help to reprogram the glia at the monkey? And then our second aim is to determine whether we can do this in the actual uh, monkey itself. And for this aim, um, I want to just schematize what the, what the plan is. Um, an uninfected normal retina would look like this. We see the Mueller glia in these light blue with the cones in gray, the bipolars and the ganglion cells, inner retinal neurons. And when we will infect with the reprogramming factors in the, into some of the Mueller glia, a subset of the Mueller glia, and as those generate uh, bipolars or cones or, or ganglion cells, we should be able to track those because they'll retain the green uh, GFP labeling from the originally infected Mueller cell. And with this experiment, we'll be able to determine will the adeno-associated virus, AAV, selectively infect the Mueller glia only. We're using one that we think will do that. Uh, will the reprogramming factors work in monkeys to make new neurons? We don't know that, but I think we'll be able to figure that out from this experiment. Will they connect with the other retinal neurons? That's where Fred Rieke and Rachel Wong come in as experts in the connectivity and circuit analysis of retinas in primates. And then will there be any adverse consequences from this? Will uh, making these new neurons that feed into the existing circuit, will they behave normally or will they behave somewhat abnormally? And we just don't know that yet. From the mice, it's difficult to know for sure, but so far we haven't seen any adverse consequences in mice. And then our second um, part to this aim is to make a laser legion of the cones to mimic end stage loss of cones. Uh, which happens in, as I said, end-stage retinitis pigmentosa or macular degeneration. And so we're going to laser damage uh, some of the cones, and then we're going to infect uh, with the reprogramming factors into the Mueller glia. And what we, what we hope is that these Mueller glia will then give rise to new cones like we've seen in the mice. Uh, in addition, they'll also probably give rise to other retinal cells, which they do in the, in the fish and the birds, um, but those cells usually don't, uh, aren't, aren't preserved because they're not needed. Whereas the cones, since they are needed, uh, will be preserved in the fish. And we hope that the similar thing will happen in the, in the non-human primate, but we don't know that yet. And that's what we're, one of our aims of this, of this grant. So will the AAV continue to only infect the mutant glia in the injured retina? Will these reprogramming factors continue to work in the injured retina? Will the loss of cones bias the regeneration to just that fate? Uh, there is some bias in fish to the regeneration process um, of the neurons that were, did, that were lost. And then will the new neurons connect with the other retinal neurons after the injury? 
Uh, and will there again be any adverse consequences? So our, we have a pretty aggressive timeline and set of milestones with this year being the AAB construction and testing for reprogramming in vitro. Um, and then year, year two and three, um, we'll start the in vivo reprogramming. And then finally the cone ablation studies uh, and reprogramming to stimulate regeneration in the adult. Um, I think the future of retinal regeneration uh, is really that it, I think it, it could offer a very, a very uh, useful uh, sort of adjunct to the work that's going on with transplants, because in some cases, if the retina is damaged, it may be difficult to do the transplants. But with our studies, you can think of it as regenerating the retina from the inside out. And so the proposed studies, if successful, will provide uh, a basis for clinical studies, though we're not as far along as some of the programs with TRAP, but we'll have a better idea of the best AAV vector design for targeting the mutant glial cell. We'll know whether primate mutant glial, and particularly those in the fovea, which is unique to primates, if that can serve as a source for regeneration, and we'll begin to define the possible adverse events associated with this approach of in vivo reprogramming. And so that's those goals, I think, uh, if met, will help to attract um, funding for the next steps, uh, in, in particular, trying to come up with a clinical product and then uh, design the ideal clinical trial. Uh, and with that, I want to uh, thank the foundation once again, and um, I will stop sharing. And uh, as we've said, I will take questions at the end. Dr. Ray, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I would like to know, let the people in the audience know uh, we do see your questions. We have logged them, and we will get to them at the end of the presentations. Um, next, we have up uh, is Dr. Hendrik Scholl, who's going to tell us all about how um, he has big plans for reanimating um, dormant cone photoreceptors. Can't wait to hear your presentation, Dr. Scholl. Please take it away. Thank you, Chad, and uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to, to speak today. Uh, I must say I'm honored. It's a spectacular group of colleagues that, uh, that have presented, uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be part, part of that group. So uh, I will uh, present uh, our project on cone-based optogenetic vision restoration, and I uh, divided it into first the principle behind cone-based optogenetic vision restoration. Then I will talk about the clinical characterization of patients eligible for that approach. And uh, last, the translational plan. So uh, this is an overview of what, uh, what could be done uh, if uh, the retina degenerates. On the left, we have uh, a healthy retina. We have these three layers, the so photoreceptors on top, then in the middle, bipolar cells, and then ganglion cells. Uh, if the retina degenerates, then the rods uh, are lost and the cones uh, lose their outer segments. So this is uh, depicted uh, in the middle. And on the right, there we see uh, a stage where there is significant degeneration in the retina, and there would be mostly inner retinal neurons uh, that, that would remain. For that, uh, for that approach um, uh, to target those inner retinal neurons, we have uh, now a very prominent example based on research from Boton Droska, who is a co-founder of Gensite. And Gensite, as you may have heard, just uh, completed uh, uh, um, the first couple of subjects and reported on the first subject in Nature Medicine uh, three weeks ago to <clears throat> um, use optogenetics and uh, transduce ganglion cells by intravitreal injection. Uh, and uh, uh, this approach uh, uh, works obviously uh, in, a, in a situation where those ganglion cells are still left. However, there's quite a hurdle because all the machinery of the retina uh, uh, would not be used because ganglion cells are actually not made to sense light. They are made to, um, to calculate the visual signal that would come from photoreceptors. So at IOB, we base our approach on a basic research uh, a paper that was published by Boton Broska uh, pretty much exactly 11 years ago in science, where um, optogenetics were used 
to target remaining cone cell bodies. And we know that in uh, photoreceptor dystrophies that such cone cell bodies remain in the retina and of course bipolar cells and ganglion cells and they can be used uh, to, uh, to further uh, calculate the signal and then send it through the optic nerve uh, to the brain. So uh, that approach is the IOB approach. The IOB stands for Institute of Molecular and Clinical Ophthalmology Basel. And this is what we are working on. So to get back to the, uh, to the approach that I showed on the right, this is the paper that I referred to that was published um, on May 24th where we have seen partial recovery of visual function in a patient uh, suffering from retinitis pigmentosa with no light perception. Uh, that uh, 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 participant in that study uh, obtained an intravitreal injection of an optogenetic uh, compound, uh, uh, transfecting, transducing ganglion cells uh, in, in the retina. And after a couple of months, uh, uh, including visual rehabilitation and uh, getting used to the uh, light goggles that were used in order to transmit a visual signal uh, to the retina that you see in this, uh, uh, in this patient here uh, to the left. You also see this helmet because they, they, they collected um, VEP signal in, in that subject. They found that that patient was now able to at least perform a couple of uh, significant visual tasks that he was not able to do before. So that was a proof of principle that optogenetics um, uh, can work in, uh, in a human uh, a situation in a patient that was completely blind from uh, retinitis pigmentosa. And uh, I mentioned that our approach uh, at IOB is based on Botond, uh, Botond Roska's approach uh, and paper published in, in Science 11 years ago, where he could show that if you target those so-called dormant uh, cone photoreceptors in a mouse model, uh, you can restore vision. And that was shown using electrophysiology on the lower left, uh, but also um, uh, in behavioral, behavioral uh, uh, experiments shown on the lower middle and, and to the lower right. So in parallel, what we are doing, we have uh, we clinically characterize eligible patients. And I would like to show that a little bit because our approach would not be applicable to all patients, but a large subset of patients. So to target cone photoreceptors, they need to be available in the retina. So when we look at the left and we know that the very center of the retina uh, is packed with cones and has the largest cone density, the patient in, in, on the left has foveal atrophy, which means that in the central retina, in the fovea, there are almost no cells left, which means there are also no cones left. And uh, this patient would not be uh, eligible for such an approach. As opposed to two examples that is actually from a paper of Art uh, These are two, two examples uh, on the top, a patient with uh, Gucci 2D, uh, mutated retinal dystrophy on, on, the, on the lower, in the lower panel, SEP290. So here we see that although these patients are uh, um, uh, extremely handicapped, uh, have almost no or no light perception, uh, carrying mutations in those two genes, uh, we see that the retinal structure is mostly preserved. So those retinas, um, at least um, in terms of thicknesses of individual layers of the retina, are near normal or almost indistinguishable from normal. The question now is when we have a random patient here shown to the right, and we do some segmentation here, uh, and, and, and see there appears to be some retina left in the, in the very center, is that patient eligible for such an approach? So we um, uh, tried a semi-automated approach to segment the retina and, uh, and to uh, have a system uh, in place that would allow uh, to identify patients that are eligible. That did not really work, but we then turned to an uh, artificial intelligence based um, um, uh, uh, a procedure that now allows to consistently 
segment the retina and allow us to distinguish the retina from, from other layers consistently. And now we use those, uh, those uh, segmentations now uh, to calculate uh, 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 volume of the central retina. You see here on the left is surface, and you see that in the in the very center there is this valley, and this valley is even pronounced if there is a foveal atrophy shown here here uh, uh, in the middle panel. But here on the right we see retinal degeneration, but in the very center there is there is not that deep of a valley, which means there is preserved fovea. And we, uh, we calculate foveal volumes based on, on these data and calculate, so to speak, the cone mass that is, that is left in the center of the retina that can be targeted with our approach of optogenetic vision restoration. And what we find in patients is, uh, uh, when we look at structure and function, is that in many patients, stru structure and function are correlated, which means if cells are lost, vision goes down. So there's a structure function correlation, right? So if there is less structure, there's less function. But we also find patients that have good structure, but very bad vision. So on the, on the Y axis, there's the so-called so log-mar visual acuity, which means uh, the higher the number, the lower the vision. And on the X axis, we have this foveal volume that we calculate. So these are seg segmentation data from our clinic. And what we find is uh, on this uh, lower left uh, are those patients with these red dots. Those patients show uh, really a correlation. So if there is more, if there's, they, they have, a, they have a, a very little volume and, and uh, but relatively uh, uh, diminished vision, but we see on the upper right patients that have very good volume but very low vision. And this is exactly that group of patients we're going to target. There are specific genes. It's not gene specific, but there are some genes that are obvious like Stargardt disease or ABCA4 related retinal dystrophy, where you have a cone dominated uh, uh, retinal degeneration. And those patients would typically be in the group where you see structure, fun structure function correlation that would not be eligible, but then others such as CRX or H2A that would be very good candidates. Again, an example on, on the right, we see an obstetric patient, no light perception, very well-preserved retinal structure that would be eligible for, for, our, for our approach and just below a healthy subject. Our estimate now on a relatively large group of patients is that our approach uh, would, be, uh, uh, would be applicable to about 20% of patients with very low vision uh, that have this foveal sparing where we see these dormant cones. We initiated the so-called iconic uh, study. Uh, and here you see the iconic study group where we reached out uh, to uh, many centers around the world. Almost all of them, by the way, are uh, connected to Foundation Fighting Blindness. Uh, this will be by far the biggest data set on patients eligible for optogenetic vision restoration, where we, uh, where we uh, obtain now images retinal images of patients affected by uh, retinitis pigmentosa and allied retinal dystrophies that have very low vision. We segment the data uh, and uh, report back to the centers about, about uh, our findings and now make a distinction between eligible and non-eligible patients for our study. So what's our translational plan? I think this is uh, one of the most important slides here. Um, we optimized every component of the therapeutic vector to induce expression in cones, including the cone-specific promoter, the transgene, regulatory elements, and AV capsids. And we use key technologies uh, at IOB in order to accomplish that. On the left, you see in the first row, mouse retina. On, this, on the second row, you see retinal organoids. This is a key technology that we use at IOB and my colleagues may have seen our paper that was published in Cell last October, where we describe um, a very efficient technology to use iPS to induce uh, uh, retinal organoids and grow them in large quantities, including light uh, sensitivity uh, at IOB. The third row is human retina. This is, uh, these are uh, multi-organ donors um, where we harvest the retina, uh, keep the retina alive, 
uh, and, uh, and obtain uh, data shown on the th third row. And then the last row is our non-human primate facilities. We actually have two facilities that we are currently using uh, to conduct non-human primate uh, uh, experiments. With our best candidates, currently we can target 90% of human uh, and non-human primate primary cones. This is, shows our translational plan for our, for our program. You see it for specific AIM-1. Uh, the preliminary lead candidate optimization will take four months, then functional testing, and then we will get to our definite lead candidate optimization study. Then uh, we go to technology transfer, GMP manufacturing, and uh, uh, prepare our definite preclinical study. Our milestones will be uh, the lead candidate selected for the definite, definite lead candidate optimization study in non-human primates that sh we should reach after nine months. The clinical candidate should be ready by month 16. We will uh, 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 finish GMP manufacturing CMC to go into CMG production by month 24 and um, uh, have our definite preclinical study completed uh, by the end of year three. So our translational plan for cone based optogenetics includes a technology de development part. We have an initial lead candidate vector that reliably works across all models. Again, the models are non-human primates, IPS derived retinal organoids and ex vivo human retinas. The final lead candidate will be established by the last quarter of this year. And functional studies in human retinas and macaque studies will follow. On the clinical side that, that we do in parallel, we developed a method to determine patient eligibility. And we are conducting a large retrospective ocular imaging study to identify a patient pool together with other FFB members, our so-called iconic study. And with that, I would like to acknowledge my co-workers especially Bottom Roska, the director of the Molecular Center of IOB. I serve at uh, as IOB, IOB's clinical uh, uh, center director. Benze Georgi, who is our head of clinical translation. In our clinical team, Lukas Janeschitz and Sultan Reichs. In our translational team, Sarah Töni, Jane Metzel and Barry Klingler. We have collaborators uh, at Semmelweis University uh, in uh, Budapest and ETH Zurich, where we uh, work with machine learning uh, with Carsten Borgwart and uh, Michael Adama uh, to analyze the retinal images. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm very happy to take questions. Dr. Scholl, thank you for such a great presentation. We have quite a few questions here. And since you just came off of presenting, I'll go to you first. And then Dr. Ray, you have quite a few. Um, you'll be next. So the first question for you, uh, Dr. Scholl, is and it's a multi-part, so bear with me here, um, is how long do dormant cone cell bodies survive? Will they retain long enough for optogenetics approach to be useful? And will you also need neural protection um, to stop their, the rest of their, I guess, disease state or disease progression? That's an excellent question, I must say. That, it's a, that's a really good question, right? So, so our, our estimate, it, and this is a cross-sectional study, shows that about 20% would be eligible. The question is, would, they, would these cones survive forever? We do not know, and nobody knows. Obviously, they survive for decades, but would they survive forever? We, we don't know. What's the effect of the optogenetic transduction on those cones after we perform the therapy? This is also not known. By the way, it's even not known for Luxtona, right? Or what does Luxtona do with the transduced cells? Do they survive longer or shorter? We would hope they survive longer. We would hope the same with our optogenic approach. And sorry, and the, the, the third part of the question, right? I, th I, I, th I think I covered two of the three. Right, <clears throat> I'm saying, that will you need neural protection? Yeah, the, the, the answer is, we also do not know, but it may be helpful. Of course, it, right? So if, if that means that with neuroprotection, uh, those cone cell bodies would survive longer, that would clearly be beneficial, right? Is it necessary to make our approach work? No. Would it make our approach better if those neuroprotective agents work? The answer is most likely yes. Okay. The next question is, would your 
therapy help restore loss in peripheral vision for IRD rod cone disease patients? So currently, uh, I take a, a, a multiple steps here. So in a, we would like to de-risk our program and we really would like uh, to see if such an approach would work and would provide useful vision in that group of people and patients we are going to treat. And therefore we concentrated on the center of the retina. There is uh, other observations. We know that from the retinal uh, prosthesis field that because of various reasons, including the cortical magnif magnification factor, there's very good reason to concentrate on the very center of the retina because we uh, predict the results will be better. Is it still possible to also reach peripheral cones or cone cell bodies or dormant cones in the, in the, in the more peripheral retina? The answer is most likely yes, although with our approach, because we aim to do a subretinal delivery, which means that the blab would be somewhat restricted to the center of the retina, which means in our first clinical trial, we would not even target so it, such peripheral cones. But the overall approach could, could very well be used to target peripheral cones if they survive. All right, and the last question I have for you, is the Willis Eye Hospital in Philadelphia one of your locations that you have pulled human candidate imaging from? The answer is no, but it can, can very well be uh, one of the future sites, of course. And I know colleagues there. All right, thank you. Dr. Ray, we have a few questions for you now. Um, someone would like to know, how many miller glia cells do you need for normal retinal functioning? If you convert too many, um, too many of those cells to neurons, will, new photoreceptors, will the new photoreceptors be able to function? Yeah, that's a good question. So far, when in our mouse studies, we're generally targeting only about 10% of them. And so with that, we see no adverse issues with respect to the retinal function or structure. So it seems like while there's not, I wouldn't say biologically, there's an abundance of Mueller cells. Uh, one of the things that happens when you convert a Mueller cell to a progenitor cell uh, with this approach is that that cell undergoes uh, a cell division. And so it can make additional cells. In the fish, they can, multiple, they can proliferate many, many times. And so they can fill in a big area of dead cells that way. But in our approach so far, we only see them going through one cell division or at most two cell divisions. So some Mueller cells do seem to be lost with this approach, but mostly uh, at the level that, we're, that we think would provide a functional benefit, which would be, for example, in the macula, maybe 10 to 20% of the uh, cones restored, we would be losing very small numbers of Mueller cells to do that. Thank you. The next question for you is, <clears throat> how do you force the pre-neurons to become either rods or cones? I, that's an excellent question. And we're working on that. Um, the approach that we're gonna take initially is, is using the combination of transcription factors that we have in hand right now, which will generate a multiple, all these different types of neurons. This is essentially what happens in the fish. When they regenerate, they, there is some bias to making the cells that they need. So for example, if cones are lost, they will bias the, the progenitor cells to make some new cones, but mostly they make all the different retinal cell types. And then what happens is the cells that aren't needed either connect to the circuit and survive, but don't uh, add a, are not a problem for the, for the fish, or they are, they, those unneeded cells will degenerate. But ideally, like you say, we'd like to um, direct these cells, not just to making any kind of neuron, but selectively the neurons that we need in that, in that particular patient. So obviously, uh, yes, yeah, so that's what we're working on right now is to add additional transcription factors to this mix to see if we can come up with a third uh, one for our, our existing factor, two-factor combination that will um, allow us to dial in exactly the cell type we need, say, for example, cones. And Dr. Ray, from your estimation, if you were 100% successful in actually converting um, the Mueller cells into, into photoreceptor cells that are functional and restore vision, how long of a follow-up do you think you would need in your studies in, in, the, in the monkey model to actually say whether or not it's actually continuous, if there's 
any safety issues of that. So if you were taking this to the FDA, how, how long would you say you would need to monitor these animals in order to give us a thumbs up or thumbs down? I think with the, um, with the fact that these are not, you know, these are not factors that stimulate rampant proliferation. So they're not going to uh, cause a tumor or anything like that. I think in some ways it's safer than a cell transplant. Um, there's no, none of the factors that we're using has ever been shown to induce uh, tumorigenesis. Um, so I think it's more akin to the safety levels that you need for other gene therapy trials. One of the advantages is that since it's a restoration of function, similar to the optogenetic approach, uh, you don't have to wait for a long time to see results. So it's not like you're looking for a slowing of degeneration where you may need to monitor for a couple of years just to see if the, uh, if the treatment was effective. These restorative or regenerative approaches, you can get feedback on, on the clinical trial pretty quickly to see whether the patient now has any, um, has any restored vision or improvement in the vision. So I think, um, I think the safety studies would be similar to what other AAV safety trials have included so far. Uh, and I think the, um, the des clinical trial design, if, if we're 100% successful in the monkey, we would, we would be following in the footsteps, I think, of the optogenetics um, uh, folks, other than that we'll be targeting the muted glia to make new neurons, rather than just uh, you know, targeting the existing remaining neurons for improving their function. And building on that uh, success, if you had to guess, um, how long before you think that this therapy could be available for humans? You know, I think that's one of the nice things about the TRAP program is that these studies that we will do in the next couple of years would, will really help us to answer that question. I think mouse studies are great. I mean, kind of amazing really that the, this process can be recapitulated from fish to mice, but I, I think they're not ex very predictive of how quickly you can actually get into human. And as you've heard, you know, a study in mouse um, by Botan Raska is only now reaching uh, the point where a clinical trial can be, uh, can be designed for an optogenetic approach. So I think we're, we're behind by that much, but I also think that the monkey studies will allow us to really tell whether or not um, this could work in a large eye, in a fovea, in all the things that mice don't have that have limited clinical translation. Uh, and so I think this is this funding is key to really answering that question. So I would say, ask me that again in two years, and I'll have a much better answer for you. <laughs> will do, will do. Thank you for that. And it looks like we have time for one more question. And this question is actually for um, Dr. Colin. If you could please come back on camera and unmute yourself. Uh, the question for you is, can AONs be delivered using a slow release implant? Uh, in theory, I would say yes. Uh, at the moment, it's, it's not done yet. Uh, I think first we need to show that they work. And I think once uh, we can show that they work, I think the next step is to say, okay, can we do it in, in a way that it's less discomforting for patients? So instead of having, having to undergo injections two to four times per year, uh, can we make a slow release device? So All I right. think in theory, yes, but in practice, uh, to my knowledge, not yet. So easier said than done. So awesome. Yes. Um, thank you for that. And it looks like I just have one more slide to show before we close. So um, again, thank you to all the presenters and all the attendees. I think this was a very, this was a wonderful event. Um, I learned a lot. I hope you all did as well. And we look forward to seeing these programs blossom over the next couple of years into actual therapies that reach the clinic. Um, just to let you know a couple more of the activities we have going on at the uh, Foundation Fighting Blindness. Soon we will release our next call for our next applicant pool um, within the next few weeks. So within about a year's time, you'll be getting another invite um, for another kickoff meeting for some great programs as well. Upcoming events include our 21 for 21 webinar event, which is a free webinar for eye care professionals um, that will feature some of the intriguing and innovative research efforts underway for IRDs and AMD. And also we have our Night for Sight going on June 24th. And this is really us celebrating 50 years of uh, the 
the foundation and the inaugural Beacon Society. Um, please check that out, go to our website. You can check out these events. And this particular event will be um, presented by the Two Blind Brothers. Um, with that said, again, thank you all for attending. If you have any questions, you can go to grants at fightingblindness.org. Um, and we will be ending there. Thank you all for your attendance. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.